and i can give the whole necessary instructions to you and please follow it strictly and i remember you to be very disciplined in the chat box too please use that to put, uh, put the questions only and don't make any other discussion here we have our whatsapp group cosmos to have the whole discussions in your interest and uh, once more i just want to remind you that uh, please don't get uh, out of the meet uh, stay uh, tuned at the last minute of the um, uh, this session of our webinar series and it will be very useful to you please don't miss this golden opportunity to hear uh, from the dignitaries and uh, please make good use of it and we will give you more instructions and our contact numbers and contact mail address uh, at the last part of this session so uh, please uh, keep attending the meeting at the last part of the webinar <laughs> Uh, I think uh, Bharat would like to uh, say something at this time. Uh, so Bharat, please. Okay, it is two fifty-seven. I think uh, my time was to be two fifty-eight, but uh, for the time being, let me start. Uh, are we ready to go? What about our speaker? Our speaker? Uh, no, sir. We have a few proceedings to be carried out beforehand. May That's I please? Right. I'm I'm just checking whether the speaker is uh, as joined. Okay, sir. So let me please announce the results of our previous quiz. May I? Okay, it's time. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. In fact, good afternoon. Um, welcome to the 18th session of UL Space Club's webinar series titled uh, "Electrochemistry: The Philosophy and Science" by Dr. Muhammad Mustafa, Associate Professor, Department of Chemistry and Center for Energy Sciences, ISA Pune. But before we move into today's uh, very much awaited session, let me take a couple of minutes to announce the results of UL Space Quiz 16: Max in Nature, Life, and of course, Space. As you know, we have a quiz competition, which is followed by each and every webinar every Saturday. And uh, as you know, the previous Saturday, we had a special program in, an, in association with IIST. Hence, we did not have a quiz the previous week. So this particular uh, quiz is of the quiz competition, which was uh, conducted two weeks ago on September 15th. So let me take a few moments to announce the results. Let's go the conventional way as we usually do from third to first. The third spot has been bagged by a 12th standard student from Delhi Public School, and she is Shambhavi Mishra. Congratulations. The second spot has been bagged by Om Hebar, and he's an 11th standard student from AMC City College, Jayanagar. The first prize winner, who has also gotten herself the cash prize, which is sponsored by Sindhebe Nurture, is Shreya Hedge, and she's a 12th standard student from Oxford Independent PU College, Congratulations to all the winners and all participants and best of luck to all of you for today's quiz as well. So um, the time is almost up. So let me uh, give you a quick reminder of all the instructions that you must must 100 percent follow for the smooth conducting of today's program. So let me move on to it. The first and most important instruction is to keep your mics and your cameras muted throughout the meeting. You know, when you initially join the meeting, your mics will be automatically switched off and we want it to stay off unless you have been asked to speak. Secondly, the thing is about asking questions. What we usually do is that you can ask your questions anytime, but you have to type them in the comment box. All the questions can be asked anytime in the chat box and the most important and relevant ones will be articulated and will be asked in the Q&A session, which, which will be followed, uh, which will be 
done afterwards after the talk uh, after today's special talk is done um you can ask your questions either in english or malayalam but make sure that you type the questions with the respective alphabets of the particular language that you are using like if you want to ask a question in malayalam make sure that you type the questions using malayalam alphabets and please avoid typing questions um, the usual way we are used to while chatting like typing malayalam in with english alphabets please do avoid that that is for the ease in translation of the questions the best questions will be articulated and asked in the q and a session which will be uh, followed afterwards so you can ask your questions anytime and we don't want you to interfere unless the speaker or the organizing committee want you to do so the third uh, most important thing is about uh, the ul space quiz which will be uh, following this particular session after the whole session is complete we have a quiz over google forms called the ul space quiz it is the 18th edition of ul space quiz and the questions will be based on all the things that we are going to discuss today and some general knowledge and some general aspects of the particular topic of discussion uh, the first prize winner will get a cash prize which is sponsored by sindhu bay nurture and the top 3 will also get their respective certificates besides uh, the results are and your ranking is is done based on your scores as well as your time of submission another important thing to announce is um, uh, is about a community a whatsapp community that ul space club maintains and it is called cosmos which is almost a direct gateway into ul space club you can get all live updates of our programs as well as the fact that you will be able to engage in plenty of um, exciting discussions on space facts so if you are interested in joining cosmos you could either message me or varun our contact numbers will be given pretty soon in the chat box note them down and if you are not a participant you can mail us or you can message us anytime but do introduce yourself and uh, please do tell us that you want to uh, join cosmos beforehand because we are not going to like respond to any unknown numbers if you don't know the reason they have message right so please take care of that our contact numbers will be given pretty soon these are the most important things to be taken care of and one more thing is that you should never present your screen if you uh, accidentally present your screen make sure that you click on stop presenting and another important thing is that th there is a, a possibility that someone might present their screens and because of that the uh, slides of the presenter will be lost uh, temporarily so uh, to avoid this particular thing there is a tip to all the participants when our speaker Dr. Mohammad Mustafa presents his screen. Try to pin that screen. You'll see a small pin kind of icon on uh, his window, and if you press it, you'll be able to pin his particular slides on your screen. And if you can't find his presentation, click on people, and you'll get the list of participants. Browse, and you'll be able to see his name followed by presentation, which is written inside a pair of parentheses. Click on it, and you'll be able to pin it. That is it from my part. Moving on to the introductory session from Sri Ram. Over to you, Sri Ram. Okay, Varun. Am I audible? Yes, yes, Varun. Okay. Good afternoon to all of you. Thanks to Varun Atan and Bharat for providing the instructions and announcing the results of the webinar. Is it done? Yes, yes. And I welcome all the scientists, veterans, teachers, UL Space Club organizers, students, and all other participants to the 18th session of UL Space Club webinar series. we the ul space club is the foundation under uralangal labor cooperative society stands for enriching and flourishing the scientific attitude aptitude of students within the three years from starting we conducted many great events physically that's before covid and from the beginning of this covid pandemic era we started this new thing the webinar series which is going extremely well for the past 5 months today in this 18th session we have dr mohammad mustafa as the lead speaker on the topic electrochemistry the philosophy and science he is an associate professor from uh, iser in department of chemistry and center for energy science pune in the institute of science education and research is a dream institution for many of us and so it is our privilege to have a young vibrant scientist and professor from there itself i welcome you sir we have varunatan and abhinandan here to give the instructions when it is necessary 
and moderator of the session. Our all in all, Shajis are here to control the session and give you the instructions uh, or the introductions uh, to the speaker. Our chief mentor, E.K. Kutisa, the former HRD director of ISRO, is here with us as always. Jairam sir and the whole webinar family, including the great scientists, will be with us in this full session. Master Bharat Srijit, a NTSC scholar and US Space Club fellow, is here to handle the Q&A session after the talk. And Damodaran sir is here to express the vote of thanks after the session. I welcome all of you. Without any longing, I welcome Shajil sir to take over the things. Okay. Uh, thank you, Srira. Uh, then it's our time to start our program. It's uh, 3 6, and we have today the 18th day of this webinar series. We started in the era of pandemic, and we all sit, uh, sit together in all these Saturdays for the future of our students, and we are enjoying all these things and we are flourishing our knowledge. And today, we are discussing on the uh, electrochemistry, the philosophy, history and philosophy of uh, electrochemistry. And uh, and we have a, a great personality from Indian Institute of Education uh, Research, Pune. And he is a master in electrochemistry and he is in search for new source of energy to this nation. And, and he is in the way of such uh, such a journey and he succeeded a lot in these things when we take his uh, academic excellence he's uh, he's and we can happily say that he's from uh, Wynard near district of Calicut and he uh, and his uh, graduation and post graduation was in St. Mary's College Wynard and after that he got admitted to Indian Institute of Science that's also a dream for our students and he took PhD from that great institution. And again, he proceeded with this, uh, some postdoctoral fellowship also from that uh, institution. And in addition to that, he has some, some other postdoctoral research uh, experience in EPSRC postdoctoral research fellow at St. Andrews University, United Kingdom, and postdoctoral research associate, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, and again, he has one more experience in Ron Apps Collaborative Research Fellowship, University of Joseph Foyer, France. And now he is engaged with the electrochemical uh, reactions and the in search for new types of cells and fuel efficient cells for India. And the Prime Minister of India and uh, uh, Road Transport Minister also, also appreciate his effort in Indian Institute of Education Research in Pune and he searched for new, new knowledge and new device may come from his hands. And we are lucky to have such a person with us in the 18th day of this webinar. And I thank Dr. Sujit to introducing this great personality of our nearby district to this forum. And we welcome you, uh, Dr. Mohammed Muspasa, to our forum. Now, we, today we get some more information from his electrochemistry. Electrochemistry is the need of our and its challenge in position to address global warming and paramount pollution to be emphasized in his talk. His talk will be revolving around the electrochemical phenomena, the electrode, electrolyte influence and associated enormous uh, electric fields. And he search for new types of fuel cells also and the, uh, the scientific implication of these discoveries and his research. And we are ready to explore your journey through this, uh, the wandering world of electric charges and chemistry. And that's the, also the basis of our, our life. Also, our life is also with the uh, chemical reactions in our body. And we happily welcome to you to our forum, Dr. Mohammed Uttar Mustafa, sir. Welcome, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. So can I start the, my, my presentation? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right, thank you. I will present the screen now. I'll just go to my window. I hope you are able to see my screen. Okay, and sir. Okay, sir. It's okay. So, can I please uh, interfere for a moment? Here's a tip for the participants: uh, for the, for you to lo not lose the slides at any moment, please click on the pin to screen option, uh, which you will be able to select if you click on this particular slides. 
everybody please take care of it over to you sir yeah so you are able to see my screen right absolutely sir yes thank you very much sir for your kind introduction and inviting me for this wonderful program and without any delay uh, let me go into my lecture uh, the title of my lecture today is electrochemistry the philosophy and science and as the name sounds as the title sounds my talk is divided into two parts first part is the philosophy of electrochemistry and second part is the science of electricity let me begin with the first part of my talk the philosophy of electrochemistry this philosophy of electrochemistry is in fact is not a general philosophy of electrochemistry it reflects only my personal view on electrochemistry okay and let me begin with the philosophy of electrochemistry science has reached a point that science has reached a, a point that it in fact recognizes every cell in a living body as an electric battery science has reached a point that it recognizes every cell in a living body as an electric battery which means which means the human mechanism which means the human mechanism is a collection of millions of living batteries therefore the human body is a perfect battery and you are made out of 50 trillion living cells you are made out of 50 trillion living cells which means you are not an individual but a community and science has understood that every cell has a negative voltage on the inside and a positive voltage on the outside a negative voltage on the inside and a positive voltage on the outside which means there is a voltage difference a potential difference between the inside and the outside which happens only for a battery which means every cell every cell every live cell is a kind of tiny electric battery with almost a voltage of 1.4 volt which is well known and you are made out of 50 trillion living cells and if i assume that all the 50 trillion living cells are arranged in series i would expect 50 trillion cells multiplied by 1.4 volt 700 trillion volts of electricity right now in your body it's a tremendous amount of energy or tremendous amount of electricity right now in your body and this amount of energy is beyond your perceptive capability for sure and if you are wise if you are wise enough you can use this energy for doing constructive things and if you are a, i mean uh, and if you are a fool then you can misuse it for various other nonsense things for example this energy is called with the training and meditation you can focus this energy called chi for constructive purposes for example if you take the example of if you take the example of bruce lee bruce lee had utilized this energy to become an amazing fighter the uh, i mean the history has ever seen if you take the case of jitu krishnamurti if you take the case of jitu krishnamurti a great philosopher who lived in the 20th century he in fact utilized this energy for healing purposes he could in fact he could in fact heal the people without any medication just by using his hands so it offers plethora of opportunities for you if you are wise enough but the point is but the point is human mechanism human mechanism is a collection of millions of living battery and this battery and this battery is completely charged when you are young this battery is completely charged when you are young and as you age the battery slowly drains out when the battery completely drains out that person will die therefore we are like primary batteries can never be recharged and remember one thing that batteries are electrochemical devices batteries are electrochemical devices and you are in fact a kind of electric battery your innate nature is a kind of an electric battery therefore i would say the first philosophy of electrochemistry is electrochemistry is the study about yourself because because your innate nature is a kind of an electric battery now you may ask me a question are there any evidences to suggest that your mechanism is a kind of an electric battery the human mechanism is a kind of electric battery are there any evidences to suggest i do not have in fact because the battery we are talking about is very subtle in nature 
It is beyond your five senses. It's beyond the perceptive capability of your five senses. You must pay attention to understand its operation. And in fact, I have one example to show the uh, uh, to show you that there is a kind of an inbuilt electric battery in your body. You must have heard about electrocardiogram or ECG. I don't know how many of you know that it is an electrochemical technique. Electrocardiogram is a kind of technique utilized to diagnose the electrical and muscular functions of your heart. Electrical and muscular functions of your heart. And you, and I'm sure you all know that the heart is a two-stage electrical pump. It's a two-stage electrical pump. And my question is, if heart is a two-stage electrical pump, where is the electrical power supply for your heart? Because it is beating continuously 24 into 7. Where is the electrical power supply for your heart to beat continuously or incessantly? Where is the electrical power supply? And recently, scientists have discovered that. See, any electrical pump requires an electrical power supply. Therefore, the question is very valid. Where is the electrical power supply for your heart to beat continuously? Recently, scientists have discovered that there is an, I mean, heart has its own automatic pacemaker or battery called Sinaotrial or SA node located in the right atrium. And very interestingly, scientists have observed that SA node acts independently of the brain to generate electricity for the heart to beat incessantly or continuously. And the second question I have, the second philosophy I have is why Karina Kapoor drinks green tea? Again, there is a connection with electrochemistry, maybe in a diametrically opposite side. Before going into this, uh, into this discussion, let me tell you something about a very famous equation in electrochemistry, which is called Nernst equation. Some of you might have heard about this equation, Nernst equation, which, which is in fact one of the foundations of equilibrium electrochemistry. This equation can be represented mathematically as shown here. On the left hand side, you have an energy term or a potential term. On the right hand side, we have a ratio of concentration. Concentration of oxidized species divided by concentration of reduced species. Very simple. I don't want to go into the details of this equation. If you increase this ratio, concentration of oxidized species divided by reduced species, automatically the left hand side will increase. Well known. If you decrease it, the left hand side will decrease. Please keep that in mind. I must tell you an interesting point here. Karina Kapoor also knows this equation, in fact. I'll show you how. Karina Kapoor drinks green tea. That is the point of discussion today. And the point is, this is mainly because she eats a lot of junk food. And you all know that junk food contains a lot of oxidants. It contains a lot of oxidants, oxidizing agents. It contains a lot of oxidants. What happens is that if you consume food containing a lot of oxidants, the Nernst equation says that this ratio will go up. If this ratio goes up, there will be excessive accumulation of negative energy in your body. And if there is excessive accumulation of negative energy in your body, your skin will wrinkle. You will experience premature aging, which means you will age faster and your skin will lose its natural glow. And there will be a lot of health complications for sure. Karina Kapoor is aware of that. And she drinks a lot of green tea because green tea contains a lot of antioxidants. Antioxidants, opposite of oxidants. Antioxidants. Green tea contains five times of antioxidants, which means the equation again says, if you drink a lot of green tea, this ratio will come down and you can prevent the excessive accumulation of negative energy in your body. And you can maintain the natural glow of your skin. And you can prevent premature aging. And you will have a healthy life. And Karina Kapoor is aware of that. That is why she drinks a lot of green tea. And the message here is, Karina also knows electrochemistry. And why not you? That's the point I have. Now, let me go to the second part of my talk that is about the science of electrochemistry, science of electricity. Electrochemistry is behind a wide variety of things. It is behind the batteries that powers your mobile phone and laptops right now. It is behind the operation of the batteries that power your mobile phones and batteries right now. It is behind the operation of fuel cells, solar cells, which are zero polluting energy technologies. It is behind the corrosion, 
which can even break an aircraft's wing just like that when you are on a flight. It is behind the industrial production of chemicals such as chlorine, sodium hydroxide, fluorine, aluminum, etc. It is often behind many biological redox reactions. I would say that electrochemistry saves millions of lives every day worldwide. This is mainly because the portable glucose sensor, the portable glucose sensor, which is available in the market, you can buy it from any pharmacy, is actually an electrochemical device. In one touch, you can get the glucose levels in your body and you can take deadly um, and you can take precautions against deadly lifestyle diseases. And it's an electrochemical device, so I would say it saves millions of lives every day worldwide. All over the world, industries are looking for fuel cell powered electric buses and electric cars. People are trying to develop fuel cell powered electric buses and electric cars. This is mainly because this is mainly because fuel cell. The generation of electricity, the, gen the generation of electricity in a fuel cell happens in a zero polluting pathway. It does not emit any greenhouse gases during the production of electricity. And remember one thing. Fuel cell is again an see fuel cell is again an electrochemical device. In a different context, in a different context, electrochemistry comes into operation in various forms of life thriving on this planet. Electrochemistry comes into picture, comes into operation in various forms of life thriving on this planet. For example, if you came, uh, if you take the case of rattle snake, which is a blind snake which cannot see the question comes how does it find its food how did it see how does it find its prey because it's a blind snake rattlesnake can identify the exact location of its prey by using the principle of static electricity again electrochemistry if you take the case of electric eel electric eel which is a, which is a blind fish again which is a blind fish again its body contains thousands of tiny batteries arranged in series and it can produce voltage up to 600 volts, 600 volts. So it's a huge amount of voltage. And if you are smart enough, you can in fact light up a Christmas tree with an electric eel. And people have done that. But the point is, this shows an encounter between, this shows an encounter between a tiny electric eel and a giant and alligator, crocodile in the wild, it is captured by the Discovery Channel and you can see. What is the outcome of this encounter? You must be wondering. Outcome of the encounter is, you can see here, the alligator is gone. Even though it's a tiny guy, it can produce a tremendous amount of voltage. So the electrochemistry provides a kind of defense mechanism for this species to survive see for this species to, uh, see for this species to survive on this uh, i mean on this planet and recently scientists from Vanderbilt university observed that electric eel can coil around the prey and which in fact amplifies the voltage output two to three times leading to instantaneous killing of the prey it's a very interesting fact in fact then comes the curious case of hammerhead shark. Hammerhead sharks, hammer, hammer contains, hammer is this region is called hammer. Hammer contains very powerful electrochemical sensory organ and it can even detect very weak electrical fields. And usually the prey, usually the prey tend to hide under the sand. After locating the hammerhead shark, it tend to hide under the sand. But you all know that any living being, any living species can produce an electric field. Any living species has an electric field surrounding that species. So even if it is hiding under the sand, this fellow is equipped with powerful electrochemical sensory organ, which can pick up very weak electrical fields also. So this fellow can scan the area and pinpoint the exact location of its hidden Again, electrochemistry provides food for this, I mean, food for this poor species. Then comes the amazing example of flashlight fish. Flashlight fish is a kind of nocturnal fish. Nocturnal means it comes out only in the nighttime. This fish is very sensitive to the light. 
it does not even come out even on a full moon day. It, it is that much sensitive to light. They spent most of the day light hours hidden in caves and or I mean or the holes in the reef surface. And they come out for feeding in the night time. And they are equipped with a light organ, a torch, a kind of torch. They are equipped with a light organ because they are coming out in the night, in the night for uh, feeding. And very interestingly, they are equipped with a light organ or a kind of torch to help them locate small planktonic prey. And very interestingly, you can see this is actually a, a picture photograph I mean, uh, taken by the National Geographic Channel when the uh, when the flashlight is off, this is when the light is on. And very interestingly, you can see this shows a school of a community of flashlight fish. You can see very beautiful light. And this is the light organ you can see. This is a this is one single flashlight fish, and this is the light organ of the torch. And you can see here, it has got a subocular bioluminescent organ which contains a kind of bioluminescent bacteria within. And this bioluminescent bacteria is sustained. This bioluminescent bacteria is sustained by is sustained by the nutrients provided by the flashlight fish. In turn, the bioluminescent bacteria provides light for the flashlight fish. Uh, I mean, for locating its prey or food. So there is a kind of symbiotic relationship between the flashlight fish and the bioluminescent bacteria. So it, this is in fact an amazing example of bioelectricity. Then comes the question, how does male chameleon attract females? Please don't mistake me. I am talking in the context of the nature. I am talking in the context of the nature. In the nature, there is always a fight. If you look into the nature, if you look into the nature, you will see that. You will see that. Especially the males, especially the males fight among themselves for the right to mate, for the right to reproduce, for the right to propagate and procreate. That is why these attracting females are extremely important in the nature. Most of you guys do it this way, using the techniques of feral larvae. But for a species like chameleon, feral larvae is not available. But she is equipped with very powerful electrochemical phenomena called electrochromism. Chameleons show darker colors than anchor or attempting to scare or intimidate others. Male chameleons show very beautiful green color when it wants to court females. When it wants to attract females, male chameleons adopts a very beautiful green color. It's again the electrochromic phenomena in electrochemistry. And I would say electrochemistry is the fair and lovely of chameleons. You must have seen this plant, touch me not plant. These plants, their leaves fold inwards when touched. They close during darkness and open in light. They are sometimes called humble plant also. And this folding and opening of the leaves is again due to the concentration cell phenomena in electrochemistry. And finally, you must have seen fireflies. Fireflies are winged beetles commonly called fire, I mean, lightning bugs for their conspicuous use of bioluminescence during twilight to attract mates or prey. Electrochemically, electrochemically, it is possible to mimic a firefly in a laboratory. Electrochemically, it is possible to mimic a firefly in a laboratory. And we have, in fact, mimicked a firefly in a laboratory. And uh, I don't think that this video is working. so. I will skip this anyway. Electrochemically, it is possible to uh, um, mimic a firefly. Yes, and it has got innumerable applications in medical diagnostics, which is called electrochemiluminescence. This all tells that electrochemistry is very, very powerful. It is indeed very powerful. Now, I think that my talk will be incomplete without discussing about the history of electrochemistry. Electrochemistry began in 1791 when an Italian biologist, Galvani, when he was dissecting the leg of a dead frog, 
when he was dissecting the leg of a dead frog, he accidentally touched the leg of the dead frog with the two dissimilar metals. And there was a sudden jerky motion. There was a sudden, so there was a sudden vibration, which he named it as animal electricity. The discovery of animal electricity spread like wildfire in the Europe because it was something about animating a dead thing, a dead body. The discovery was fiercely opposed by the religious leaders of the day who claimed that it is against the divine edict that soul is the only force which can animate, which can animate a body. So you can clearly see that there is a clash between science and beliefs with the discovery of animal electricity. In 1793, another Italian biologist, sorry, uh, I mean chemist Alessandra Volta, discovered that, found that it is not animal electricity, but simple electricity and the sudden jerky motion or vibration in the leg of the dead frog was caused by the dissimilar nature of the metal. The dissimilar nature of the metal and he made the first battery he made the first battery by sandwiching a paper soaked in salt water between two dissimilar metals and he piled several of them in series to amplify the voltage output the history of batteries began quite magnificently by illuminating the world surrounding it then came the discovery of Michael Faraday, who in the year 1834 discovered the Faraday's laws of electrolysis. But the most important development happened in the year 1905, 1905, when Julius Tuffel proposed what is called the Tuffel equation, which said that, which said that electric current passing across an electrochemical system can be amplified exponentially by changing the electric potential applied to that electrochemical system. It may sound very simple to you, but for an electrochemist, electric current is the rate of an electrochemical reaction or speed of that electrochemical reaction. And Tafel equation said for the first time to this world that the speed of an electrochemical reaction can be amplified exponentially by changing the applied voltage across the electrochemical system. Now the question is, to what did Tuffel's discovery lead in our lifetime? What is the implication of this simple equation? I would say to the first moon landing in the year 1969. In the 64 years from the discovery of Tuffel equation, people could use this equation for the development of electrochemical fuel cell, which produced electricity from chemicals without any moving parts. The Tuffel equation, in fact, led to the discovery of electrochemical fuel cell, which generated electricity from chemicals without any moving parts. And you can see, to, I mean, due to the better performance, alkaline fuel cells were used in the Apollo mission to land on the moon and it and it was possible because of the Tuffel equation I mean proposed in 1905. Then came the war of currents, the war between Nicholas Tesla and Thomas Alva Edison. Nicholas Tesla was a Serbian American scientist who was the inventor of who invented the alternating current system. And Thomas Alva Edison, on the other hand, was the inventor of direct current. In the 1880s, the two waged a war of currents over whose electrical system would power the world. Tesla's alternating current versus Edison's direct current. It is described that Tesla was renowned for his achievements and showmanship, eventually earning him a reputation in popular culture as an archetypal mad scientist. If I describe the personality of Tesla, Tesla was very tall, slender, and imposing, with a dashing moustache like Mamuti, and an impeccable sense of style. He had an impeccable sense of style. On the other hand, Edison was known to be a person with poor hygiene and low standards of tidiness. Edison, in fact, carried out a false campaign to discourage the use of alternating current. What he did was he caught stray dogs, he caught stray dogs, 
and publicly kill them using alternating current to show that alternating current is deadly. Edison's desperation to disparage the system of alternating current, to discourage, to discourage the use of alternating current, in fact, led to the development of what is called electric chair to electrocute criminals. And there have been numerous accounts of women buying for human, I mean, trying for Tesla's affection. Even some madly in love with him. Tesla, though polite and soft spoken, did not have any known relationships. So if you want to be a genius, you must be careful that you should not have a boyfriend or girlfriend. Tesla, in fact, suffered from a disorder called obsessive compulsive disorder. It's, it is a mental disorder, OCD, which grew stronger towards the end of his life. And he died penniless and alone in a hotel in New York. This obsessive compulsive disorder. Recently, Nature magazine wrote that this OCD disorder, this OCD type disorder happens to a person who is in fact a genius. OCD means OCD is, OCD is described as a perfectionism disorder. A perfectionism disorder. They want everything to be perfect in their life. If anything is imperfect, they would feel extreme anxiety beyond your imagination. You can't imagine their anxiety level. For example, if there is a pile of books in this room and if one of the books is slightly displaced, misplaced, then they would feel extreme anxiety for that imperfection because they want everything to be perfect. And Tesla suffered from that disorder called OCD. And recently Nature magazine wrote that OCD is actually a disorder for, I mean, I mean, cost, uh, I mean, uh, usually genius suffer from this kind of disorder. So, uh, this tells that genius always have a kind of mental disorder. It does not mean that if somebody has a mental disorder, he is a genius. Okay. It is not the other way. Now you may ask me, can you define electrochemistry? Electrochemistry begins when you dip a metal into a solution containing ions. Therefore, electrochemistry is a study of phenomena at the electrode solution interface. Your electrode, metallic electrode contains electrons, solution contains ions, and you know that these electrons can cross the interface. Electrons can cross the interface. And if you imagine that electron leaves the metallic electrode to the solution side, automatically metal will acquire a positive charge because electron has left the electrode. So it will get a positive charge. And electron went to the solution side, which means solution side will acquire a negative charge. Which means you can clearly see there is a charge separation building up at the interfacial region. If there is a charge separation for sure, there must be a potential difference setting up at the interface, which is the fundamental act in electrochemistry. This potential difference. And this potential difference is given by the very famous dense equation, which we discussed sometimes back. Now, you must remember that this potential difference exists only at the metal solution or the electrode electrolyte interface, not in the bulk phases, only at the point of contact, only at the interface it is present. For that reason, the structure of the metal solution interface is extremely important in electrochemistry. And there are various models and theories to predict the structure of metal solution interfaces in electrochemistry. And all these theories can be easily understood. All these theories can be easily understood if you understand the relation between Ambani and the beggar. If you understand the relation between Ambani and the beggar, you can understand all these theories very easily. Because all, because according to all these theories, metal is like Ambani. According to all these theories, metal is like Ambani. Super rich guy. Why metal is like Ambani? According to electron C model. According to electron C model, Metal is described as metal ions immersed in a sea of electrons. Sea of electrons. So he's a super rich guy with electrons, metal. So like Ambani. My question to you is, what will happen to Ambani 
if he donates one crore to a beggar ambani donates one crore to a beggar what will happen to ambani i'm sure nothing is going to happen to ambani because he has more than a lakh crore rupees in fact nothing is going to happen to ambani if nothing happens to ambani should we worry about ambani we should not worry about ambani because nothing happens to him the same situation happens to the metal also metal is a super rich guy with electrons even if he donates a few electrons to the solution side nothing is going to happen to the metal because he's super rich guy so we should not worry about the metal because he's a rich guy but the solution is like a beggar solution is like a beggar in fact he has a few ions he has got a few ions dissolved but not a super rich guy like metal before getting one crore his life was pathetic and miserable he was struggling to make both ends meet in his daily life he was leading a pathetic life miserable life on one fine day ambani ambani walked into his she walked into the beggar and gave one crore to the beggar one one fine day can you imagine what can happen to the beggar i'm sure his life will be transformed quite dramatically on that day maybe something like this so something quite dramatic happens to the beggar and the solution is like a beggar according to all the theories exactly similar situation happens when you dip a metal into a solution containing ions metal is a super rich guy nothing much happens solution is like a beggar something quite dramatic happens to the solution side therefore all the theories on the structure of the metal solution interface are primarily concerned about the solution part of the interface interface has got two parts metallic part and solution part and all the theories are primarily concerned about the solution part of the interface because solution is the beggar something dramatic happens only to the solution so the theories are worrying only about the solution part <laughs> there are various theories like uh, parallel plate condenser model i don't want to discuss all these things i will discuss very briefly the stern's model the last model stern's model stern's model is to describe the structure of metal solution interface according to stern's model your metal solution interface is like ar rahman's musical concert ar rahman's musical concerts mustafa mustafa don't worry mustafa song you must have heard about that so electrode is like ar rahman singing on the stage okay and your electrolyte is like the audience responding to ar rahman's song if you go to any musical concert if you go to any musical concert you will see in the first row if you go to any musical concert you will see in the first row people like this you will see in the first row people like this very important people politicians dignitaries influential people big big artist all of them will be in the front row and they will be enjoying the concert without much physical movement they are enjoying the music but without physical movement but if you go to the back of the stage any stage you will always see group of people enjoying the music with a lot of physical movement with a lot of physical movement exactly according to stern's model exactly same situation happens at the metal solution interface according to stern's model electrode is like ar rahman singing on the stage and the electrolyte is like the audience is like the audience responding to his song the first layer of electrolyte which is very close to the electrode will be glued will be glued to the electrode surface which means they cannot move physically they cannot exhibit much physical movement because they are glued onto the electrode surface as you go further away from the electrode the, uh, i mean to the last layer of the electrolyte it will exhibit a lot of physical movement mainly because the last layer of electrolyte is under the influence of thermal fluctuations because it is far away from the electric field of the electrode so it is under the dominant influence of thermal fluctuations so they will exhibit a lot of physical movement 
So the Stearns model very beautifully predicts that your structure of metal solution interface is analogous to A.R. Rahman's mystical concern. So I don't want to talk about all these things. Now the question comes here, why electrochemistry now? Why am I talking about electrochemistry all the way from Pune now? I am talking about electrochemistry to you today in the context of the historic Paris Agreement on Climate Change. On December 2015, on December 2015, world leaders have unanimously agreed to limit the global warming temperature to 1.5 degrees C. The reason is because of the adverse effects of global warming. It is because of the adverse effects of global warming. The living examples of this, the uh, I mean, the living examples of this man-made tragedy can be seen here. And these poor species have irreversibly lost, I mean, have irreversibly lost their habitats because of global warming. You can see these species are clinging onto the last pieces of iceberg left in their ecosystem. Usually polar bears are, I mean, very fierce and aggressive, ferocious and aggressive. And they are heavily dependent upon the ice layers to find their daily meal. If there is no ice, they cannot find the food and they will starve to death. Because of global warming, there are no ice layers and you can see they are starving to death. You all know that carbon dioxide is primarily responsible for global warming. And carbon dioxide can dissolve in water as carbonic acid, making that water acidic in nature, acidic in nature. And increased emission of carbon dioxide have increased the accumulation of carbon dioxide in the ocean as carbonic acid, making those regions extremely acidic in nature. That has led to the that has led to the erosion of shells of shellfish, coral reefs thriving in those ecosystems. And very painfully, the story comes from the Midway Island. Very painfully, the story comes from the Midway Island. Midway Island is, is an island located in the remote Pacific Ocean. The most important aspect to remember about Midway Island is it is located within the North Pacific Gyre. North Pacific Gyre. This is the North Pacific Gyre, this circle, and Midway Island is right within the North Pacific Gyre. What is North Pacific Gyre? North Pacific Gyre is the biggest garbage patch in the world. North Pacific Gyre is the biggest garbage patch in the world. Whatever the whatever the garbage you throw out from your home, if it is not degradable, if it is not biodegradable, it eventually accumulate, it, it eventually reach the ocean, it eventually accumulate in the ocean. And all this garbage, what it, it can be plastic, it can be glass, it can be electronic waste, etc. etc. Whatever you throw out eventually accumulate in the ocean. All this garbage, all this trash continuously swirl in global ocean currents in what is called the North Pacific Gyre. In North Pacific Gyre, all these garbages from all around the world are continuously being swirled, continuously swirled, swirled. So all the garbages from all around the world are continuously, I mean, are continuously swirled in global ocean currents in the North Pacific Gyre. And Midway Island is located right within the North Pacific Gyre. So you can imagine all the plastic pieces, plastic bottles, everything, all the trash are continuously being swirled, swirled, and eventually what will happen, it will accumulate on the beaches of Midway Island. It will eventually accumulate on the beaches of Midway Island. And scientists described it as, I mean, the Midway Island acts like fingers of a comp, collecting tons of garbage on its beaches. The problem is, Midway Island is a home for a beautiful bird by name Laysan albatros. It's a gracious bird, fluent in the air with its six-foot wingspan. But the problem is, 
for all wrong reasons. This plastic pieces looks very attractive for this lace and albatross bird. All the plastic pieces accumulating on the beaches looks very attractive for the lace and albatross. So they look like it looks like for the I mean for the bird it looks like food. So they consume it. Since they are plastic, I mean, since those uh, things are plastic pieces, the birds cannot digest it. The birds cannot digest it, and they eventually and they will eventually die very pathetically. And millions of birds were died in in the Midway Island. And to inspect the situation, a group of Canadian scientists visited the spot. And when they opened the rib cages of a dead lazy albatross, they could find only plastic pieces. They could find only plastic pieces. So these birds were punished severely, not for their mistake, but for our greed for money. This shows our casual indifference to the future of other species thriving on this ecosystem, thriving on this planet. Our casual indifference to the future of other species is clearly visible in this photograph. This poor turtle, this poor turtle got trapped in a six pack plastic ring when it was hatched out of its egg. It had to grow up with this plastic ring around its body. And you can see the middle portion got deformed. Remember one thing that plastic is the end product of Plastic is the end product of the same petroleum industry, which is responsible for global warming. Plastic is the end product of the same petroleum industry, which is responsible for global warming. You all know that. Turtle, in fact, turtle, in fact, lay their eggs in sandy beaches. They bury the eggs within the sand. We all know that. And it is well documented that the temperature of the sand, it is well documented that the temperature of the sand in fact decides the sex of the baby turtle. The sex of the baby turtle is decided by the temperature of the sand. If the temperature is higher, it will be a female. If it is lower, it will be a male. And recently, a scientist by name Alan from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in Hawaii inspected the sex ratio on Rain Island in Australia, which is the biggest and most important green sea turtle nesting ground in the Pacific Ocean. And she, in fact, inspected the sex ratio of baby turtles by the blood test method, which she developed uh, recently in her laboratory. Uh, alarmingly, the number was among the 117 turtles inspected, 116 were females and only one was male. 116 were females and one was male. Because of global warming, sand temperatures increased so much, leading to an alarming ratio of female to male ratio. Almost 99 percentage was, I mean, were females. And it's very obvious fact that it's an obvious fact that this kind of sex ratio will lead to the eradication of this species from this planet for sure. And this news has been widely covered across the globe by many magazines and newspapers. You can see here. And you might think that, OK, turtle is going to be eradicated, why I should worry about it. I must tell you that the danger is knocking on your doorstep. Danger is right on your doorstep. Recently, scientists from Belgium have found microplastic particles in the flesh of salmon fish. Salmon fish is a kind of migratory fish, very popular fish in the European continent. It, I mean, they hatch in fresh water, migrate to the ocean, and again comes back to the fresh water. I mean, and again comes back to the fresh water to reproduce. So it's a kind of migratory fish going back and forth. And Belgian scientists found that 
during this migratory process, the body of the salmon fish accumulate microplastic particles. And if you consume such a fish, those microplastic particles will eventually find a way into your body. It will stay there, remain there, leading to very serious health complications in the later life. So the danger is knocking on your doorstep. Quite alarmingly, Canada has started exporting fresh air to China at a rate of RS10 per bottle. If you go to China, if you go to dine, if you go for a dinner in China, for example, in any, in any hotel in China, you have to pay a special tax for breathing fresh air because there is no fresh air there. Because in the race for technology, in the race for technology development, in the race for industry development, we have forgotten to purify, I mean, I mean to, to, um, uh, to keep their climate clean and cool. So you need to pay tax for breathing fresh air in China, in fact. So you will think that it's again about, it's all about China, why I should worry about China, because we are in India. LG India and Honeywell India have already started manufacturing air purifiers in India as well. It is in this context, electrochemistry assumes great significance. It is in this context, world leaders around the world have decided to limit the global warming temperature to 1.5 degrees C. And to limit the global warming temperature to 1.5 degrees C, you must have uh, zero emission or zero polluting energy technologies, sometimes between 2030 to 2050. To limit the global warming temperature to 1.5 degrees C, you must develop zero emission or zero polluting energy technologies, sometimes between 2030 to 2050. And electrochemical devices like fuel cells, batteries, supercapacitors, and solar cells are potential zero polluting energy technologies to save this planet. It is in this context only I am talking to you about electrochemistry today. And we are a group of people, in fact, from Isakuna, working, in fact, actively in the domain of electrochemistry. And to give you a brief introduction about uh, Isarpuna, in fact, this is uh, the Isarpuna night view, in fact. And uh, this is our campus. It's a very beautiful campus. And uh, Isarpuna, in fact, offers uh, various uh, programs for young students, where, you know, in Isarpuna, the teaching program is well integrated with world-class research. It is not a simple teaching. Research is well, in fact, well blended with your teaching program. Research is an active component of your overall education in Isarpuna. And Isarpuna offers, in fact, a BSMS dual degree in science after plus two. And uh, Isarpuna is going to offer, I heard, master's degree programs in science after BSc. I think this year it will be launched. And Isarpuna also offers integrated PhD programs after your bachelor's degree and also offers PhD programs. And I don't want to go into my research work anyway. Uh, we are, as I said, we are working in all these dimensions. And uh, I'll just go to the last slide. So I wind up my talk with only one message. This is the only one message I have for you. When the last tree has been cut down, the last fish caught, the last river poisoned only when they will realize that one cannot eat money. That is the only message I have. Thank you very much for listening to my talk. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Muhammad Mustafa. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Yes, thank and you. It was an all round uh, talk, and it starts with the lifeless uh, battery and it ends with the life, and it shows that the whole life is uh, with the electricity, and we li live here with the electricity in our body, 
and if you want to live in this world we should be so careful in reducing the temperature and we should we should be in the journey of energy conservation life and social and other educational aspect also it was a wonderful journey of education and i think our students get a lot of time for for interacting with you and sure i am sure that they will exploit this location to explore with you sir such a scholar like you and it next is our question answer session i invite our students and bharat rajit to lead the question answer session so can i stop sharing the slide now okay sir sure thank you shall you sir please do tell me if i am audible and visible yes yes okay you are visible well okay uh, it would be it would have been good if i was not visible because i certainly don't prefer to look this way एक्सक्यूज मी सूर्य दत्तन कैन यू प्लीज म्यूट यू माइट सूर्य दत्तन जे आर ओके Ah, that is it. Thank you so much, Mohammad Mustafa sir. That was a beautiful session. In fact, it covered different aspects of the topic that uh, we were to discuss about. In fact, being a 12th standard student myself, I understand the importance of electrochemistry, considering the degree of questions that we have to tackle from this particular chapter with this uh, taught in 12th standard chemistry. So, uh, for us, it has been a beautiful experience. and it is my honor to uh, moderate the q and a session today it is after a while that i have been able to moderate this particular session which is in fact one of my favorites so uh, we have had plenty of uh, good questions and uh, let me begin with a question which is based on something that uh, mustafa sir just talked about about uh, canada exporting uh, fresh air to china and all these kinds of things so the question is from lakshmi priya who from ramania hss calicut who has asked Uh, is it possible to purify atmospheric air through electrochemistry so wonderful question i think i i invite her to electrochemistry in fact so wonderful question uh people have been trying to purify the air uh, by various technologies and uh, one such research topic is purifying the air using metal organic framework because you need to selectively uh, i mean allow only the passage of oxygen and nitrogen by excluding carbon dioxide and other poisonous gases so you need to develop in fact a porous structure which excludes some of the gaseous species but at the, at the same time allowing certain other uh, important gases to permeate so there are metal organic frameworks available to purify uh, i mean uh, air but as of now there are no electrochemical technologies available and i invite the questioner to do electrochemistry and find out a method for that electrochemistry should in fact offers an opportunity for air purification but it has not been explored so far so uh, i think the questioner should should look into that uh, very seriously hello bharat carry on bharat carry on bharat i think there is some connectivity problem to bharat that's that's a thing happened here that's uh, that happened previously also he is joining and disconnecting that is happening and is there anybody you can uh, okay sir i am back that please pardon me for this very bad experience uh, these are some issues that uh, have been becoming very common for me uh, quite some time now uh, so can we please move to the next question uh, the next question is from uh, a very integral part of ul space club for quite a while now he is a member of ul space club and he is abhiram tp uh, may i please invite abhiram tp to please ask his question uh, thank you for the time i will yes you are audible okay thank you sir sir my dear is this uh, can we produce the electricity through uh, electric eel for our needs uh, in our day to day life see people have tried in fact uh, uh, to generate uh, electricity from electric eel for uh, purposes like uh, uh, powering their christmas tree and all see the problem is electric eel does not produce electricity all the time when it is under stress when it find see when it wants to find food 
only that time it generate electricity so so it's a kind of you know situation uh, only when it is under stress you can generate it so it is not a continuous source of electricity so it is very unreliable to depend on electricity for generation of electricity i mean it is very unreliable to depend on the electric yield for the for the generation of electricity because it depends on uh, it depends upon the situation the electric yield faces it if it encounters an enemy so suddenly there will be electricity generation that time you can harvest it otherwise no Uh, sir, it? can I yes please go. please go ahead i uh, said okay okay sir sir uh, can we decrease the e waste to electrochemistry see people have been uh, trying to convert the e waste into useful product using electrochemical technologies and uh, for example if you throw out a lithium uh, ion battery the battery pack from your um, uh, from your mobile phone or laptop they have see they have been trying to recover that using electrochemical techniques to convert it into uh, useful products this research is already going on but i i would say it has not been very successful so there are a lot of opportunities to explore that okay thank you thank you sir thanks so much all right Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, may I please move on to the next question? The next question is from another member of who has been uh, very close with the UN Space Club, and that is Ab Abhinav P. Pradeep. Uh, may I please invite Abhinav P. Pradeep to ask uh, his question? Sir, my name is Abhinav P. Pradeep. I am I am from Varlamundai district. Uh, my question is, how 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 will be electrochemistry useful in the future space explorations like uh, interstellar missions so your uh, question is how electrochemistry is useful in the future space exploration am i correct abhinav yes yes sir electrochemistry has always been useful mainly because if you <coughs> take about a, if you take a fuel cell okay if you take a fuel cell I have sh shown you a slide where the byproduct is water. You have seen it, right? Water. So this water is actually a, uh, is in fact a pure source of water. So when there is generation of electricity, it gives you a byproduct that is a very clean water. It can be utilized for drinking purposes in the space where there is no water source. There is one source of water, in fact, in the space exploration. Second thing is, uh, you must have read recently about. Uh, the discovery of rust on the surface of the moon even though there is no oxygen in fact so rust or corrosion is in fact a, is in fact an electrochemical phenomenon so the the news shows that there is a rust even in the absence of oxygen which means there is an electrochemical phenomena happening even in the absence of oxygen so you must do a lot of electrochemical studies to understand the source of this rust on the surface of the moon because it is happening in the absence of oxygen so you need to figure out which species is responsible for the rust so electrochemistry in fact offers a lot of opportunities uh, in the space in the uh, in the space exploration and without electrochemistry it will never be complete sir i have one more question thank you so much sir yes okay. please go ahead in fact i have one more question Sir, can we able to solve the energy crisis of the current world by the effective utilization of electrochemistry and the generating energy from the biological world? I don't think so. Mainly because uh, we are trying to increase the efficiency of batteries, fuel cells, all those things we are doing. We always make a device by thinking that it will last long. It lasts very long. But we must remember one thing: that everything has a life. Everything is prone to changes. in this planet that is the fundamental life mechanism on this planet everything is changing every moment okay so making a battery which is very efficient which lasts life long is impossible making a fuel cell which lasts life long is impossible because it is made by people like us i mean who are i mean uh, uh, i mean who are uh, very limited in fact the most important thing to remember here is everything is prone to changes every moment so that changes reflects in batteries fuel cells everywhere so whatever the battery you make whatever the fuel cell you make whatever the solar cell you make it will be less efficient than what we need till we exist on this planet 
it will never be solved it is a constant exploration thank you so much sir so the yeah. next question is in fact uh, from me myself uh, the quick may I please uh, narrate the question for you uh, how much efficient are electrochemical cells compared to nuclear fission or fusion cells in terms of efficiency life and sustainability many a time uh, where long battery long life batteries are needed nuclear cells are preferred how do electrochemical fuel cells compare to them in this regard uh, i would also like to relate this particular question to two other questions that have been asked in fact uh, very uh, like for the past few years we've heard of nuclear fusion cells also coming into discussion with uh, the uh, discussions of things like helium 3 which could be possibly extract extracted from places like the moon and can be fused to provide energy in fact there has been a question from uh, adidev jd who was asked can we use metals at any other space body he meant maybe some kind of other celestial body maybe metals from any or any materials from other uh, celestial bodies for generating energy by electrochemical uh, means for return and by returning them from these places in fact uh, you must have just heard abhinav p pratib ask a question of how electrochemistry is going to be useful in future interstellar explorations and kind of things so how do you relate this electrochemical cells um, how do you compare them with uh, the kind of fuels mostly nuclear fuels that uh, are per currently being used hmm. okay so when it come uh, when i uh, go to the first part of your question on uh, comparing electrochemical devices with the nuclear technologies i would not count them in terms of efficiency but i would look at them in terms of their uh, safety issues that is what the basis in which i am looking at that because i do not think efficiency wise if you look at it uh, it is not the right way of comparing in terms of safety you know that if something happens of course nuclear uh, energy is quite useful no doubt about that but if something happens it will be beyond human control that may not be the case when it, uh, when it comes to electrochemical devices so there is a lot of uh, i mean uh, uh, i mean uh, control over this the operation of these electrochemical devices when it comes to their operation that is not the case in the case of nuclear energy generation so i would make the comparison in that aspect i am not telling that nuclear energy is not required i i must tell that the comparison should be in that aspect so nuclear energy has its own place batteries and fuel cells see have their own place because nuclear energy is nuclear energy is mainly for i mean um, distribution of power supply to a large area whereas batteries and uh, fuel cells such kind of things are mainly for for example electric vehicles laptops your scooter your mobile phone etc etc so they have their own domains to work on we should not look at them as competitors we need both we cannot say that we need only this we need only that we cannot say that for some purposes you need the nuclear energy for some applications you must depend upon electrochemical devices we need both that is my answer then second question that is talking about uh, metal uh, metals excavated from some kind of extraterrestrial world can it be used see when it comes to the i mean usage of uh, an electro in an electrochemical device it depends upon uh, its uh, i mean uh, electrode potential in the electrochemical series if the metallics uh, species which you are talking about has got enough negative potential it can be utilized but the question is for a battery for manufacturing a battery always the availability of that see, of that metal is very important the availability of the metal is extremely important for manufacturing any battery for example if you take the lithium ion battery that is right now in your mobile phone we i mean we in india we do not have any lithium resource we have to buy we have to buy it from other countries in fact argentina belgium such kind of countries you have to buy i mean chile these are the countries they have the lithium resources so the question is what is the point of developing lithium ion battery in india there is no point because we don't have any lithium resources in our country we have to depend on other countries for lithium resources so if you are dependent upon an extraterrestrial world for manufacturing your battery that is never going to be practical because for a successful battery the source of the metal should be right available right in front of you and only the battery can be successful otherwise it will not lead it will not lead to a sustainable electrochemical device 
that's my answer thank you sir uh, in fact one of the most important things that you discussed today is about uh, fuel cells particularly the hydrogen fuel cell and uh, the merits it has compared to the conventional ways of energy production that we are used to in fact you related it with uh, greenhouse gases to uh, global warming and all all these kinds of things there's been a question from kalyani uh, who is a student from little flower school nilambur and uh, she's asked uh, how can electrochemistry prevent global warming um, besides this particular um, hydrogen fuel cell kind of thing all right okay so the the global i, I must clarify one point that electrochemistry is not the one which is going to prevent the global warming it is in fact it is in fact a method it's in fact a part of the entire process entire game to prevent the global warming see how to prevent the global warming is for example if you um, see we can prevent the global warming only if we turn our attention to our attention to renewable energy resources we have to harvest the energy of the sun sunlight energy of the wind wind energy we have to harvest the tidal energy all these things we have to harvest and then utilize for our daily purposes but the question is sunlight if you take the case of sunlight sunlight is available only in the daytime night time it is not available but if you look at your usage your usage comes maximum in the night time not in the daytime so there is a clear mismatch between the availability of the energy resource and their demand demand is in the night time availability is in the data sunlight so which means that whenever the sunlight is available you must store it how do you store it you can store it as you can store it as hydrogen for example by splitting water into hydrogen by using the energy of the sun by utilizing a solar cell you can split water into hydrogen and oxygen and in the night time so this you should do in the data in the night time you combine this hydrogen and oxygen in a fuel cell and generate electricity for your need or in other words in the day time the energy of the sun using a solar cell you harvest in a battery store it in a battery in a rechargeable battery you buy big big battery packs charge the battery and keep it in the night time you use it so what i'm telling you that electrochemistry alone cannot solve it it should be a combination of many sectors they should come together and work together <laughs> and they should solve this issue of global warming electrochemistry alone can solve it thank you so much sir what you've said is in fact uh, very important and has to be understood by all the participants who are present here it is a big takeaway from today's session in fact another important thing to understand is uh, from what he said is that um, it is not only electrochemistry which is going to be uh, a solution for this it is not a panacea in fact uh, interventions from each and every individual is in fact very important to overcome this particular energy uh, hazard which is currently going on the next question is an interesting one from um, dakshina anand uh, who is a student of ggmh ghss government ganpat girls higher secondary school chalapuram uh, kori code and uh, her question is sir i have heard the frog's leg twitching when electrodes touch it is it related uh, to galvanism are galvanism and electrochemistry related yes it is exactly what happens is that frogs leg frogs legs will have will have some kind of fluid some kind of water within the frogs leg that water functions like the electrolyte in a normal electrochemical cell so it is a galvanic cell for sure so when you touch the frogs leg with two dissimilar metals one metal on the one side other on the other side the fluid or the water within the frogs leg functions like the electrolyte for the ionic conduction that is how it works and it is a galvanic uh, i mean phenomena and it is a part of electrochemistry no doubt about that thank you sir uh, you have also discussed uh, about uh, how important electrochemistry is in the biological world considering how uh, animals uh, use electrochemistry Uh, to uh, protect themselves from predators in fact even in hunting itself when you ex examined the ex examples of things like the hammerhead shark now here's been a question from atmika praveen, uh, praveen who's asked do plants use them for any kind of uh, defense kind of things like uh, how the electric eel uses it do plants use them for defense or is it even required for plants to use them for defense 
I'm not. Uh, in fact, it's a very good question. Uh, anyway, asked. I, I'm not aware of uh, any defense mechanism using electrochemical principles by plants. To, I mean, as a defense mechanism for their survival. I have not come across anything like that. And if I come across, uh, surely I will uh, uh, look into it. As of now, to be honest with you, I have no idea about that. I have not come across anything like that. But I'm not denying that it will not be there. It can be there. I need to find okay. out. Uh, it's been a last question. Uh, the last question in the chat box is from uh, Manjunath. Uh, this is not the last question. Please pardon me. The last question, which is visible in the chat box, it is from Manjunath, and he's asked, "Sir, if fireflies are alive, they give light. But uh, when fireflies die, do they give light? Like it's only the chemical reaction, right? So does it have to be alive to uh, give light? Definitely, it has to be alive because only when you are alive." The energy is present in the body, right? Energy is responsible for whatever the manifestation you see around. Whatever you see around, in terms of, see, if a flower blossoms, I mean, a flower blossoms, that is, in fact, manifestation of energy in a different form. When a lion roar, the roar of a lion, it is again manifestation of energy. When a dog barks, it's again manifestation of energy. The song of a bird, manifestation of energy. So it's always the manifestation of energy in different forms. And only when that species is alive, this manifestation of energy happens. Otherwise, it does not. So your question is something related to the fundamentals of life, very fundamentals of life. And I must say that it has to be alive for, the, I mean, for, for producing the light because it is a manifestation of energy. If energy is not there, it will not be there. Okay, sir. Uh, the next question is from Lakshmi Priya, who has asked, I've heard that human stress can be converted into electricity. Is it true? Then how uh, does it work? Uh, in fact, even recently, I've seen a lot of gadgets uh, placed on the head, which uses uh, electric signals from the brain to, uh, to control things in kind of like uh, what we use a remote control for. So how yes. do these things actually work? Yeah, so uh, this is, I mean, whatever lecture is talking about is called typo electricity. So people generate electricity from the uh, motions of your leg, your hand, your, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, various parts of your human body. So it is actually converting the mechanical force into electricity. That is called typo electricity. There are materials available which can convert this mechanical vibration. For example, when you keep it near to your heart, when the stress increases, the mechanical vibration can be converted into, I mean, an electrical driving force using such kind of materials. They are called triboelectric materials. So it is possible. The mechanism is simple. It is simple. It is a simple interconversion of one form of energy into another form of energy. If there is a mechanical motion, for example, when you walk, when you walk, and if you keep this material under your uh, chappal, there will be a stress in each step, and that stress can be converted into uh, a kind of electrical driving force. It is the conversion of one form of energy into another form of energy. Only your job is to identify which material can do this conversion. That's all. It's a very simple job. Bharat. Thank you, sir. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, let's move on to the uh, towards the conclusion of today's session. We have a very important question. It was received at the beginning of the question answer session, but I didn't ask it because I found it to be extremely relevant. It has been asked by K. Suresh Kumar, sir. And in fact, in the question itself, he has mentioned the question is meant to overcome blind beliefs, if any. So it would be a real mess if I. Uh, if I narrate the question, so it is my honor to invite uh, Suresh Kumar sir to please ask your question directly to Mustafa sir. Hello. Yes. Suresh Kumar sir, are you audible? Ah uh, yes, M mic is unmuted. Thank you sir. Respect okay. sir. We know that we are living in the air, which is actually a magnet. Being a magnet, it has a magnetic field and magnetic field lines. And we are living in this magnetic field. So my first question is, uh, will our body produce electric current by electromagnetic induction? And the second part is, from ancient time, there was a belief that you had to sleep by lying in a particular direction only like East plus. Is there any scientific basis for this? Actually, I want to overcome misbeliefs, if any. 
Thank you, sir. Okay. okay. So you are asking me a very age-old question on the, the electromagnetic induction in the human body, if I am correct, in the first part of your question. And yes, second sir. part is about the sleeping direction. Uh, some people say that you have to keep your head towards the north. Oh my God, something like that. Am I correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, see, I don't think I'm the right person to answer this question anyway, but I will uh, share you my view. Electromagnetic induction, uh, there have been a couple of experiments uh, conducted by the German mm -hmm. scientist recently on um, this uh, the electromagnetic field of the human body. And uh, see, the, the, the point is, uh, the major problem with this kind of experiments are first thing is we are a living entity, right? When we are alive, we cannot be put to experiment. For example, if I have to experiment my body, first I have to be, see, I have to kill myself. Then only, uh, then only I have to, uh, then only I can be experimented. A living being cannot be experimented, in fact. That is, in fact, a hurdle in this kind of experiments. So there is no, I mean, you know, uh, there is no conclusion on. Uh, this kind of electromagnetic induction from the human body as of now. Uh, because even though there were a lot of efforts, which I read it uh, in many magazines, uh, that there were efforts from a group of German scientists to establish that, but they also could not uh, do it unambiguously. Because to put to experiment, first you have to kill the human body. That is the problem. Okay. Then second thing is uh, about your uh, uh, sleeping in one direction. Uh, to be honest with you, I have no idea about that, but uh, there are a group of scientists who believe that it is correct. And recently, and recently, there was a, a, a news article which appeared that uh, uh, this, the magnetic, I mean, uh, the magnetic field of the Earth is slowly drifting from one side to the other. If that is the case, over some time we will have to shift our direction of sleep. If that is true, and I do not have much idea about whether it is in fact true or not. I have to be, uh, I mean, honest with you in that. But scientifically speaking, and nobody has come out with a conclusive explanation for this aspect of sleeping in one direction. Because when I interacted with many scientists, they all tell that it has no meaning. But when I read religious texts, they tell that if you keep your head towards the east or west, there can be paralysis, in fact, because of the, uh, I mean, uh, uh, your, the concentration of the blood will increase in one direction. I think this kind of beliefs comes into picture mainly because our hemoglobin, it has got uh, the iron, uh, I mean, component, which is, in fact, magnetic in nature. That is the reason why this kind of beliefs comes into picture. And I am unable to confirm it unambiguously whether it is true or lie to you, sir. Okay, thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. It has been a pleasure to uh, hear from you. Uh, let's move on to the last couple of questions in today's Q&A session. This question is from Navneet Shajil, and he's asked about something that he's read about. He says that, sir, I've read about this urine battery. Like, how does it work? Uh, is it useful in our daily life? And please do comment on it. Yeah, there are various ways of looking at it. Urine battery is in fact a reality. In fact, urine battery tells that urine can be utilized as an electrolyte to generate electricity. Okay, the urine functions the role of an electrolyte. So, urine is a kind of biological waste. Okay, so when you utilize that urine in a battery as an electrolyte, what will happen is that you are able to generate electricity and the end product of the urine. In many papers, they have reported that it, it looks like a fertilizer. So it can be utilized to, I mean, for your uh, plant growth, etc., for agricultural purposes, etc., etc. Another way to look at it is not from the utilization of urine for generation of electricity, should be looked at from the uh, conversion of a biological waste into useful product. If you are able to convert urine into electricity plus a fertilizer, it is one way of converting. I mean, an animal waste into useful products. And this kind of research is going on in the world. And it's a very important world. I mean, it's, it's, it's an important area of research because you are converting biological waste into useful products. So it has to be encouraged. 
Thank you, sir. So with this, uh, we are moving on to the final question in today's Q&A session. And it has been asked by uh, Master Sriram D, who in fact was the person who welcomed you, sir. So it is my uh, pleasure to welcome Sriram to ask the final question of today's Q&A session. Over to you, Sriram. Thanks, Bharat. First of all, I, I have to show my sincere gratitude to you, sir, for the wonderful presentation. I really enjoyed that you connected things to the celebrities. It was interesting. Thank and you. my question is, uh, the one of the major problems which us, the students facing, is the lack of uh, the correct materials for the experiments in electrochemistry. Can you suggest a good free uh, software for the cyclic voltammetry simulation and all other things like in the electrochemistry? Uh, can you repeat the last part of your question, if you don't mind, Sriram? So, is there any free software for us to see the uh, or do the experiments, the simulations in? Uh, I think you are talking about the free softwares and techniques to do electrochemical uh, experiments. Um, see, uh, I do not think the free uh, softwares exist for performing electrochemical simulations and all. Uh, but in Kerala, there are a few places where you can access this kind of facilities. I believe in IIT Palakkad, they have uh, this kind of electrochemical facilities and uh, certain colleges across uh, 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 Kerala, maybe, I don't know about Malabar, but uh, uh, the southern part of Kerala will have uh, this electrochemical facilities available for various experiments. And as of now, you know, uh, there are very tiny potential stats available, like the size of your mobile phone, uh, which, you, which you can carry in your pocket for performing electrochemical experiments. And that costs almost one to two lakhs, but it is again expensive. But I do not think the free software ex exists for doing electrochemical simulations and I really doubt. Thank you, sir. thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Sri Ram. In fact, this brings us to the end of today's question and answer session. It has proved to be very informative. In fact, today's whole session has been very uh, important considering the degree of information as well as life skills and life values that you've told us, uh, Mohammed Mustafa, sir. So thank you so much uh, for being with us today. In fact, it has been an honor for me to moderate this Q&A session today. Thank you so much. I'm really sorry to the other participants whose questions I have not been able to narrate today. Uh, but don't worry, all your questions can be clarified. Uh, if you can ask all your questions in our WhatsApp group called Cosmos, and we'll have a discussion. And if you have any other questions, we can uh, revert it to Mohammed Mustafa, sir. And I hope that he'll be, uh, he'll be willing to answer any questions that uh, come up uh, to be uh, not solvable for people like us. So thank yes, you so much. Uh, Say so, yes, if they have any question, they can write to me and my uh, website is accessible and you can write to me I mean, to my uh, institute account. I will clarify those. Okay. Thank you. Bharat, Bharat uh, uh, I can see some more questions has come in the uh, comment box. Uh, okay, sir. Uh, are we, do, we, do we have enough time for all that? I think it is past 4.30. It is our, our time is 4.30, right? Okay, okay. Okay, I think uh, we should be concluding here, right? Uh, I've already announced it. Okay. Okay. Or any other questions, we'll be able to discuss uh, at any other time. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, ICER Pune is a dream institute for many of the participants today. It has been an honor to be able to interact with you today. Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, it's time for us to move on to the next sessions. But uh, mind you, we have a quiz competition followed by today's whole session. So if you stay here, the link for the quiz competition will be shown in the chat box pretty soon. I'll be posting it in one minute. After the whole session today is completed, you can go there. You can answer the questions based on what we've discussed today. And the first prize winner will get a cash prize, which is sponsored by Cinder Bay And the top three will also get their respective certificates. Thank you so much. Over to Shadil sir and Sriram for the further proceedings. OK, thank you, Bharat and Sriram, for your wonderful uh, handling of these q and sessions that, that we enjoyed. We all enjoyed together. And <clears throat> it was a great opportunity for our students to explore a a very very well known scholar of our neighboring place and he is happy to receive all these things and he handled the questions very well and again uh, he invited all of you to the uh, world of ICER and especially the ICER Pune and that, that also ignited your minds of aspiration 
And before we are going to the, uh, these uh, concluding sessions, uh, I invite our chief mentor of our UL Space Club, E.K. Kutisa, to make a reflection of the experience he felt here. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Shadil Marsh. Today has been a highly energetic day, a highly informative day on a topic on which I think probably none of us had an opportunity to listen a talk like this. This subject, as it was posed for our webinar, some of my friends had told me that what is the relationship which we will have with the space club and all that. But then, as I listened throughout today, the session, very lively, highly energetic, and flowing from a scholarly talk with excellent examples, including poor people, living people like Mamuti, A.R. Rahman, Ambani, and all that, all that. Those things have brought a elevation to today's talk to a very high level. And that has excited and inspired our students. The, the questions reflect some of uh, that aspect as well. So I am very, very happy that Dr. Muhammad Mustafa has come and delivered an exceptionally brilliant talk very effectively to and and uh, students enjoying it understanding it digesting it well and seeing its practical aspect in the energy uh, you know uh, the, the world which is uh, looking for sources of energy and a world which is looking for zero emission, a world which is wanting a zero polluting energy. The, in that scenario, this talk has added a feather in the cap of our space camp. Very many thanks to Dr. Mohammed Mustafa and the students and the teachers like Shajil and Damodaran Marsh who have made it happen and execute in such a very nice way. Thank you very much. Thanks to all. Thank you, Kutisa, for your uh, great reflection of these things. Uh, really, it was, uh, it was it is a feeling of ours, ours also. And I think, uh, Mr. Dr. A. Sujit from NIT, he is so part of us and he's part of your space for, for the for few years. And I think he's on journey, and I invite him a few words on this program. Uh, Dr. Sujit, sir, please. Sir, actually, excuse me, I am in a travel, that is why I cannot I think. I think, can you hear me? All? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> okay, okay. So, you know, <laughs> as you know that uh, Dr. Mustafa is uh, one of my close friends, and uh, uh, I, I, what I say about his talk already, already you have already experienced his talk and his talk is actually such as almost um, all the fields of our life. Actually, you see uh, in that uh, speech, he also connected his uh, electrochemistry to the environmental problems, actually the, uh, actually the challenges of uh, today's challenge. Uh, that uh, the youngsters can take up. So the talk, actually, you know that uh, the, uh, he's a he's a great academician also. He's a good researcher and also he's a good academician. So you know that uh, I I can say some words about a teacher. That means uh, uh, a mediocre teacher tells, a good teacher explains, a superior teacher demonstrates, and a great teacher inspires. So actually, you see. The Dr. Mustafa is coming under the last category. That is, uh, he is a great teacher also. So, <laughs> this uh, few words. Uh, thank you, thank you all. 
uh, for participating in the uh, seminar uh, and also special thanks to uh, dr mustafa thank you all thank you uh, thank you sujit sir for joining with us in, in the midst of your journey from a long journey and uh, it was a great day and we deal the subjects and the interaction all our business were in within our time without exceeding and it was a uh, quite uh, an experimental way we uh, we have done these things and it is very interesting and we are we limited everything within our time and with a satisfactory mode now we entering to the concluding session of this program that is a word of thanks that is from the part of uralangal labor contract society and the wagbada and the ju projects hello and hello. we have here yes and we have here t damodar sir he is the coordinator of wagbada and ju project of uralangal labor contract society and uh, i invite t damodar sir to make his uh, word of thanks here thank you sir good afternoon everyone today the 18th webinar is an ever remembering event the lead speaker dr muhammad mustafa made an extraordinary brilliant speech with a high scholastic attitude it was quite well informative the mode of presentation is excellent and student could understand well he depicted the influence of electrochemistry in our life and nature with relevant examples and made the students to explore the world of electrochemistry and its science on behalf of ulccs foundation i am proud to extend our gratitude to dr muhammad mustafa for giving such a lucid lecture sir thank you very much for being with us and expecting your cooperation further i thank all the persons behind the conducting of this webinar especially kutti sir sajil master jayaram sir master bharat master varun master abiram uh, master adidev master sriram etc i also thank all the participants of this webinar viewing directly and in other medias once again i thank all and stop my words thank you sir uh, now uh, it's time to declare uh, the next program uh, we want to hear the next about the next program from our chief mentor ek kutti sir next uh, 19th session of our uh, webinar uh, will be conducted by the, the mr shanith mr shanith m is a scientist in vssc he will be talking on the role of science role of chemistry in space the exact title he will be giving in a day or two and uh, uh, he has been in this area uh, working in this area for almost uh, 18 to 20 years and is a very well known person and is known to be an excellent teacher and uh, there is a lot of demand on him in vssc when the director vssc sponsored his name he specifically told me uh, uh, don't ask for him every time 